Good evening friends, Mr. Navasar Bhandwani, Vice President elect, Ms. Jinan Sa, Mandar Telang, Speaker of today's lecture meeting on filing of income tax return for assessment year 2012-13, my colleagues on the dais, Usav Sa <coughs> and student friends. I welcome you all to today's lecture meeting organized by the society, especially for you. This is the last lecture meeting for the current year. The faculty for today's meeting is Jinan Sa and Mandar Telam. Both are young and are well versed with the subject. They will cover various aspects for filing of income tax return and cover computation of income deduction under Chapter 6A and other amendments. I am sure you will benefit a lot from their expert advice. With this, may I now request Ustav Sa to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker for today is Ms. Jeenal Shah. She has graduated from Khudar College in the year 2006, qualified as a Chartered Accountant in November. She has worked with firms like Sudhit K. Parikhan Company, Devdar, Joglekar, Srinivasan and M.M. Sabla and Associates during her articles and post-qualification period. She has ventured as a proprietor Chartered Accountant Presently employed with DSP Merrill Lynch Limited in their corporate tax department since May 2011. She has been associated with BCAS as a core group member since July 2009. She has been a part of HR, Journal, Membership, PR and i for i committees. Today, she will take us through the budget amendments affecting the tax return for assessment year 1213 and general pointers when filing the tax return for this year. Our second speaker for today is 26-year-old Mr. Mandar Ulas Telang, graduated from R.A. Padar College, qualified as a Chartered Accountant in the year 2009 and LLB in the year 2012. Mr. Mandar is a partner in Gokhale and Sate since October 2010. He has participated in various intra-college, inter-college and national moot court competitions. He has been awarded as the best speaker in Right to Housing Quest Day competition. His main area of work is service tax and income tax. Mr. Mandar today will take us through the practical aspects of filing income tax returns for the assessment year 1213. I request Ms. Gina Shah to continue. But before Jinal gives his gives a presentation, may I now request Nausar to present both the speaker as a moment as a mark of our love and affection. Mr. Thanawala, Mr. Panjwani, Mandar, Utsaf, and dear friends, it's a pleasure to be addressing you today on the platform provided by BCS on a topic which is very useful for every chartered accountant or for every individual. No one can do without filing tax returns in India. And addressing you on a topic like this, it's a pleasure. I had to get the laptop moved from here for two reasons. First, income tax cannot be done without a book in hand. No presentation on income tax can be just without a book in hand. Second, because of my height, if the laptop is here, I cannot see you, you cannot see me. Uh, let me start with the next slide, which I think is the most important. No presentation on income tax going forward, in my opinion, would be correct, complete, accurate without the next slide. If I can just have two minutes of your attention. Rajana. 
All right, so two minutes. Information in this docket is valid only on the date of the presentation. Users are requested to please consider all retrospective amendments, past, present, future, rollbacks, court decisions, policy circulars, media clarifications, press releases, or any other surprises that may be sprung on the taxpayer by any forthcoming budget, court directives, AR rulings, CBDT instructions, assessing officers' appraisals, change of mood, whims of a few people. So please consider all of those. And then, in that light, please, let's proceed with the presentation. Uh, when you are filing tax return, let's just cover the basics very quickly and not go too much into it. I think everyone is aware the, of the general procedure of filing the tax returns. Who is required to file a tax return? Any individual, HUF, AOP, BOI, artificial person, local authority, trust, cooperative society, firms, companies, limited liability partnerships, anyone who has any taxable India income in India is required to file the tax returns. Uh, they define it as a person is required to file a tax return. I just listed out individuals, HUFs, local authorities, firms, companies, LLPs are persons. Okay, what are the heads of income under which you need to carry out your tax computations? Basically, Income Tax Act lays down that all the income which you receive needs to fall into one of the five categories for it to be taxable. Uh, the heads of income are salary income, income from house property, that is your rental income, income from business and profession, income from capital gains, and any other income from other sources. The basic rule for taxing any receipt is that it has to be a revenue receipt. If it is a capital receipt, it is taxable only if it is specifically provided in the Income Tax Act. If it is a capital re uh, revenue receipt, it is taxable unless specifically exempted in the Income Tax Act. And uh, residential status and taxability, once you have identified that what are the incomes which are liable to tax and under which head of income are you liable to pay tax, uh, whether your particular income will be covered or not depends upon your residential status. Uh, section 4 and 5 deal with uh, the categories of residential status. One is resident and ordinary resident, resident and not ordinary resident, lastly non-resident. Based on the number of days you spend in India if you are an individual or based on your uh, place of control and management, if you are a firm or a company, your residential status is dis decided. Once your residential status is decided, you have to see if you are a resident and ordinary resident of India, all your income earned, whether in India or outside India, is liable to tax in India. If you are a resident and not ordinary resident, all your income earned in India is definitely taxable. Your income earned outside India is also taxable, but only if it is earned from a business or a profession which is set up and controlled from India. Lastly, for a non-resident, only that income which accrues or arises or is deemed to accrue or deemed to arise or which is received or is deemed to receive in India is taxable. Now, these topics of accruing, arising, receiving, deemed accrual, deemed received too complicated to go into and I think if I start with it, I'll not come to the end of it. So quickly we'll move on to the next slide. These are the dates which I think will be important from tax return filing perspective. First is if you are an individual and you are or an HUF and you are not liable to income tax audit or any other statutory audit, you are required to file your return of income by 31st of July 2012 for assessment year 12-13. If you are liable to audit under Section 44AB or under any other law prevalent in India, your due date for filing tax returns would be 30th September 2012. Same if you are a partner in a firm and the firm is liable to audit under 44AB, again your due date is 30th September, reason being that your accounts cannot be finalized unless the accounts of the firm are finalized. Uh, if you are a public or a private company and you are not liable to transfer pricing audit, due date would be 30th September. If you are liable to transfer pricing audit, you have been given an extension to file your returns by 30th November 2012. Uh, for a belated return, that is, if you do not file your return by the due date, 
you have been given a period up to one year from the end of the assessment year that is up to 31st March 2014 to file your return. The disadvantage of filing a belated return is that if you have incurred any loss in the year and you want to carry it forward to the next year, you will not be able to if your return is not filed by the due date plus certain exemptions under section 10A, 10B. I think under section 10 are dependent on you filing your return by the due date. If you want to revise your return, you can revise it after uh, you have to file your original return by the due date. If you file a belated return, you are not eligible to revise your return. But if you have filed your return within the due date, that is 30th September, July or November, you are allowed to revise it within a period of one year from the end of the assessment year, that is 30th November, 30th March 2014. Thereafter, once your return due dates are there, other important due dates would be, I think, completion of tax audit. You, if you are not liable to transfer pricing audit, you have to complete your tax audit report under section 44AB by 30th September. You're not required to file it with the tax department, but your audit should be complete and your report should be ready at, in your hand before filing your tax return. Uh, if you are liable to tax audit as well as transfer pricing audit, then the due date is extended to 30th September to align with your return filing due date. And the due date for completing the transfer pricing audit is 30th November aligned with your return filing due date. Okay, let me, the basic laws are very clear. I think we have all been dealing with the normal laws day in and day out and no point refreshing it right now. What I'll do is I'll take you through the amendments which have been brought in by Finance Act 2011 and some of the amendments which have been brought in by Finance Act 2012 which will affect the returns for 2012-13 assessment year. Uh, have classified the assessment based on the heads of income under which they fall. So there have been no amendments for salary income, house property income, capital gains income or other sources income. There is an amendment for income under the business and profession, small amendments and case specific. We'll deal with it as we come there. Uh, there are some other amendments to deductions which we claim under chapter 6A which are applicable to individuals and to certain uh, specific industrial undertakings. Then there are some amendments which are generic, which are not falling in any particular head of income, like income uh, section 92C, 115BD, 115JBJC, etc. And lastly, the retrospective amendments of Finance Bill 2012. I think there have been about 20 plus retrospective amendments. So some of them have a bearing on the tax returns which you will file for the coming year. Starting with the amendments, the first is business and profession. There has been an amendment made to section 35 AA. 35 section grants enhanced deduction if a business or a profession is incurring any expenditure for the purposes of scientific research. Uh, section 2 AA has been amended to enhance the deduction, uh, deduction allowed to a company firm or an enterprise for an expenditure which it incurs by way of paying any sum to a national laboratory, to a university, to one of the IITs, to a specified person, for the purposes of scientific research only. For example, if I am uh, donating, say, 1 lakh rupees to IIT Bombay, Section 35 AA allows me to claim a deduction of twice the amount which I donate, or the amount of expenditure which I incur. So I can claim 2 lakh as a deduction from my taxable business profits. Next is uh, amendment to section 35AD. 35AD allows deduction for certain investments made in specified uh, companies. I think their motivation was to incentivize investment in infrastructure sector. Uh, 35AD says normally what happens if we incur a capital expenditure, we are required to capitalize it and uh, claim depreciation on it which lasts for about five to seven years. 35AD allows you to claim entire deduction in the year in which you are incurring the expense. Uh, 35AD has been there for a while now and they keep uh, adding the businesses which are eligible for this particular deduction. Uh, during 2011, they have added uh, two businesses. One is developing and operating a housing project in India. 
under a scheme for affordable housing approved by the central government, state government and notified by the CBDT. So if I am a housing project developer, I am a builder or a developer, I am, uh, I am complying with the scheme guidelines and most important, I am starting my operations on or after 1st April 2011. Then I can claim entire expense which I incur as a deduction in the year of incurring. I don't need to wait for five, seven years to claim that expense as a deduction from my taxable profit. Second uh, business which has been specified is production of fertilizers in India, provided I start my operations on or after 1st April 2011 and not before. 35 AD has been amended once again. What happens is when I'm incurring a capital expenditure, it's a huge amount. And if I'm giving, given 100% deduction in the year of incurring the expenditure, chances are I'm more likely than not going to sustain a loss. So to enable and also to limit the set off of that loss against my any other income, they had introduced section 73A, which said that if I am incurring a loss in a specified business as per 35 AD, then I cannot claim a deduction of that expense under normal, uh, no, for, for, under against income from my normal business. I have to claim it only against income from any other specified business. Uh, two specified businesses which were there in this section were building and operating a new hotel or a new hospital in India. Now, what happened because of the use of word new was that. It had to be, my, speci my specified business would have to be a new hotel or a new hospital. So if I'm already operating a hotel which satisfies the two-star condition or 100 bed condition, I was still not able to claim a deduction or a set off of my loss of a other eligible business. So they've just removed the word new from the uh, definition of new hotel or new business. So my specified business is any hot hotel in India or any hospital in India if I'm operating. And also I have another new hotel which I started and that new hotel is eligible for 35 AD deduction. Then the loss of the new hotel can be set off against the income from my ongoing hospital or ongoing hotel. Then there is a retrospective amendment brought in by Finance Act 2012 again to 35 AD, which I'm covering here because the topic demands. Uh, what would happen is in the hotel industry, normally the builders of the hotels are not the ones who run the hotel. They build the hotel and they outsource the operations part to a facilities management firm or to some other uh, basically operating hotel operating industry. So to enable the owners of the hotel, because if I am the owner of the hotel, I am going to be incurring the capital expenditure and not the person who is running the hotel. So to enable me to claim deduction for my capital expenditure, they have gone and amended the, they have brought in a particular uh, subsection in section 35 AD retrospectively since 2010 saying that if an SLC builds a hotel and subsequently transfers operation to another person, the builder will still be eligible to claim a deduction under section 35 AD. Uh, next is uh, employer's contribution to new pension scheme. In 2004, central government had come out with this uh, new pension scheme which was made applicable and compulsory for central government employees. Subsequently, the scheme was extended to state government employees, then to private sector employees and then to individuals also who could go and contribute in the pension scheme, deposit money and at the end of the pension life or on retirement, get annuity from the scheme. What was happening was when for, for an employee, when I am contributing as an employee, I am contributing to the scheme, an equal contribution was also being made by my employer. Ideally, the, in, the contribution which the employer made to the new pension scheme under my account was added to my taxable income. However, the employer was not being given a deduction for this. Now, this is similar to say provident fund contribution for employers where the employer contributed, employee contributed to the provident fund employee was taxed for the contribution of the employer, but employer was granted a deduction for the contribution. Now here, because under the new pension scheme, till now, employer was not granted a deduction, they have gone and amended section 36 and said that if as an employer, I contribute any amount to the 
new pension scheme of my employee, I'll be allowed to claim a deduction of it under Section 36, uh, subject to the limit being my contribution should not exceed 10% of the employee's salary. Salary is basic plus DA in terms. And uh, just to enable it, they have made consequential amendments to Section 40A which say that the contribution of the employer to the new pension scheme will not qualify for non-deduction under 40A. Thereafter, once the contribution is made by me and my employer to the new pension scheme, uh, I was eligible to claim deduction for it under Section 80CCD. 80CCD said my contribution up to 10% of my salary and employer's contribution up to 10% of my salary, both of them I could claim as a deduction from my gross total income. However, 80CCD amount plus my 80C contribution uh, amounts plus my 80CCC amounts, all of them taken together could not exceed rupees 1 lakhs. Now what they have done is, they have excluded employer's contribution. My contribution still has to be within that 1 lakh limit. But if employer contributes to my pension scheme, I get an extra deduction for it, even if it exceeds the 1 lakh limit. Uh, they have amended Section 80 CCF last year. They had introduced this scheme where if I'm investing in certain notified long-term infrastructure bonds, up to 20,000 per annum, I was eligible to claim as a deduction from my gross taxable income. Uh, the scheme has been extended to this year as well. So if, you are, uh, if you or your clients have contributed in financial year 11-12 to the long-term infrastructure bond, they'll be eligible for a deduction from their taxable income. Uh, Section 80IA is uh, amended. Basically, it provides tax holiday to certain infrastructure uh, companies. They say that 100% of the profits of these, these, these companies would be exempt or will be allowed as a deduction from taxable income for a period of 10 years. Uh, one of the companies covered was companies in the power sector, uh, companies which are generating power, which are setting up new transmission or distribution lines for power generation, or which are undertaking substantial renovation and modernization of their existing lines. Uh, the tax holiday was to be eligible for companies set up till 31st March 2011 only. Finance Act 2011 extended that timeline and said that even if your company is set up in financial year 11-12, it will be eligible for ATIA deduction. And thereafter, uh, 2012 has gone and further extended it to 2013. Another uh, small amendment which has come in is uh, Section 80 IB 9. Again, Section 80 IB provides certain tax holidays to specified undertaking. The holidays were provided. I mean, tax holidays were there for either commercial production of mineral oil or commercial production of natural gas, and uh, in certain specified areas. Uh, now, what they have done is they have brought in a sunset clause. Till now, there was no upper limit. Any point of time, if I was engaged in commercial production of mineral oil, I was eligible for a deduction under Section 80 IB 9. They have amended Section 80 IB 9 saying that if I'm engaged in commercial production of mineral oil anywhere in India for contracts awarded after 1st April 2011, I'll not be eligible to claim 80, uh, the deduction. Then they have gone and amended Section 92C2. 92C2 basically deals with computation of the arm's length price. I am required, all my international transactions need to be benchmarked to the comparable third party transactions. And if I am not meeting the arm's length price, it will be so certified by the auditor. And I'll be required to make an addition in my, on my computation of income for the shortfall in my income. Uh, till 31st March 2010, 2011, I was given a margin or what do you call it, safe harbor of plus or minus 5%. Uh, basically, if the difference between my price and the arm's length price did not exceed 5%, they said that, okay, you cannot be exact you cannot match exactly to what a third party is charging because while you are undertaking the transaction, you might not be aware of their prices, plus your businesses are different. 
So I'll give you 5% margin, stay within the plus minus 5% limit and I'll not make any addition to your taxable income. Last year in finance, uh, at 2011, they went and said, they removed the words 5%, they said any percent as may be specified by the CBDT. Now the problem is, so far for assessment year 12-13, no percentage has been specified as CBDT. And if they do not specify, that means you compulsorily need to be at a better rate than the arm's length price, otherwise you will be required to make a adjustment. Now I'm hoping that there will be some amendment coming soon, maybe this must be a slip out. And they might be coming up with say plus minus 3% because that is what the budget 2012 has also brought in. But so, so far as it does not come, you never know. Uh, then they have introduced Section 115 BBD. Section 115 BBD says, if I am an Indian company and I am holding more than 26% of the share capital of an offshore company, if that offshore company declares dividend and I uh, declares dividend and I am eligible to that dividend income, in that case, I will not be required to pay tax at the rate of 30%, which is the tax rate applicable to an Indian company, but I will be given a concessional tax rate of 15%. Initially, this uh, lower tax rate was there only for assessment year 12-13. Now it has been extended to 13-14 also. So this is one of the things which may be borne in mind while you are doing your tax computations. Okay. Uh, Matt, I think we are all aware of for any company, if the book profits are higher than my taxable profits and the tax on my book profits computed at 18.5% for assessment year 12-13 is higher than my tax, uh, tax liability on my normal income, then I am liable to pay minimum alternate tax. Uh, till last year, the MAT rate was 18%, that is I have to compute my book profits as per the PNL account, make plus or minus some additions to the, as per the Income Tax Act Section 115JB, arrive at the adjusted book profit. On the adjusted book profit, if 18.5% is higher than the tax on my normal taxable income, then I'm liable to pay MAT. And the rate has been increased in this year from 18% to 18.5%. Another small amendment or major amendment for some would be that Till now, SEZ developers and units in SEZ were not liable to MAT. Now they have been made uh, chargeable to MAT. They have also introduced the concept of MAT on limited liability partnerships. LLPs were till now to be taxed as firms. However, and because they were to be taxed as firms, they were not liable to MAT. However, now specifically for LLPs, they have introduced uh, minimum alternate minimum tax, they call it AMT. Uh, they have introduced section 115JC to 115JF. The rate of uh, AMT has been kept the same as MAT rate, that is 18.5%. Uh, only difference is because I am a limited liability partnership, I will not be required to prepare my uh, profit and loss account as per Schedule 6 prescribed by the Companies Act. So they said, okay, fine, you don't prepare your Schedule 6 profit statement. You take your taxable income as per income tax provisions. To that, you add all the deductions which you have claimed under Chapter 6A plus if you are claiming any exemption under Section 10 AA, then you add that also. Whatever is the new income is your adjusted total income for the purposes of AMT. And on that you compute 8.5% as your tax compare it with the tax which you would have paid on your normal income tax income. And if it is higher, you go and pay AMT. Provisions are very similar to MAT, except that the mode of computation of the total income on which AMT is to be levied is much simpler. Uh, then they have obviously like MAT, here they have introduced the concept of tax credit. If you are paying AMT, you will be eligible to take it forward for 10 years and uh, adjust it against your future normal tax liability. You are required to get an audit report under Section 20, uh, Inform 29C. Keep it on hand while you are filing the tax return. All right. Basically, the difference between MAT and AMT, I just did a prima facie analysis and what I found is it's almost the same except for the fact that uh, 
for mat i am required to pay tax on cap uh, long term capital gains under section 1038 even if they are exempt under the income tax act mat is to be paid on that long term capital gains here in case of amt even those long term capital gains have been treated as not liable uh, next is an amendment which has been made in section 13a they have introduced subsection 8 basically section 11 12 13 deal with exemptions granted to charitable and religious trust now charitable was defined in section 215 said educational other facilities and last was any general object of public utility would be eligible for any object of general public utility would qualify as a charitable purpose however if you are carrying on a business and profession and saying that your object is general public utility then only so long as the income from business that business and profession does not exceed 25 lakhs you will be considered as a charitable organization however the minute the income of your business and profession exceeds 25 lakhs you will be a non charitable organization so now they have inserted subsection 8 which says that the minute your business profession income exceeds 25 lakhs and you are carrying your uh, charitable object is general public public utility then all your income in that year would be liable to tax you will not lose your exemption you are required to get some exemption if you are a charitable trust you have to get a certificate and registration done so you will not lose that registration but in that year if you are earning any income whether it is for charitable purpose or not for charitable purposes we are going to be taxing it and this is a retrospective amendment with effect from assessment year 19 vodafone tax i think very famous their idea was to tax vodafone what they have gone and done is they have amended the definition of capital asset they have gone and amended the definition of transfer they have brought in retrospective amendment to section 9 it's so scary i mean just imagine the way they have defined transfer it's like if mr panjwani transfers his pen to mr oja sitting over there they'll say that okay this is a transferable to tax i mean it's so widely worded definition having said that uh basically what you need to take care is they are trying to tax offshore transfer between two non residents if as a result of that offshore transfer there is an underlying asset in india which is also changing its ownership it's very difficult to arrive at this because consider an mnc where the structures are so complicated you will not be able to know whether there is any ownership changing hands in india and they are saying that if that asset located offshore derives its value substantially from an indian asset then that asset, offshore transfer will be taxable in india now substantially has not been defined how do we take it do we take it to mean anything more than 10% any asset deriving its value more than 10% in india is liable to tax in india not clear another issue which might also crop up is the participatory notes as of now there is no clarification which has i mean good doing rounds of the newspapers already but nothing officially which has come out from cbdt or the finance ministry but uh, the fact is that participatory notes are what in people residing abroad wanting to invest in indian shares they come through a via media and they are issued shares over outside india now even for them if they internally sell those participatory notes they are liable to tax in india now imagine an individual an 80 year old sitting there and selling his participatory note to another 80 year old how will he know that he is liable to pay taxes in india now this is one of the major complications which might need to be i mean many such complications coming in but lot of things to be borne in mind which are coming as a result of this amendment presumptive taxation section 44 ad allows me to pay tax on a presumptive basis at 8% of my gross receipts if my gross receipts during the year meet certain criteria i think they do not exceed 60 lakhs and some other criteria which have been laid down in 45 ad if i am meeting those criteria i am allowed allowed to treat my taxable income as only 8% of my gross receipts uh, now this section has been amended and it has been made inapplicable to three classes of individuals one is if i am in the profession of law medicine engineering architecture accountancy technical consultancy interior decoration or any other profession notified by cbdt that is any profession laid down in 44ad1 of the income tax act is not eligible to 
uh, use the presumptive taxation provisions. If I am earning business, commission or brokerage income, again I am not eligible to use uh, business and profession income. Or if I am in the business of running an agency, any kind of agency, I am not able, I am not eligible to use presumptive taxation provisions. Uh, cost of acquisition provisions under section 49A have been modified to say that if a firm AOP BOI or a sole proprietorship has been succeeded by a company and the assets of the firm AOP BOI or the sole proprietorship are transferred to the company as a result of the succession, then subject to the conditions laid down in section 47, the cost of acquisition of those assets to the firm AOP BOI or sole proprietorship will be taken as the cost of acquisition for the company. Amendment is retrospective. It was uh, made effective 99-2000 uh, only to clarify any ambiguity which was there in those uh, in section 49. This is an amendment which has been brought in by Finance Act 2012, an important amendment which will again create some complications. What Finance Act has done is it has gone and modified section 139. 139 lays down who all are required to file tax returns. It says you are not required to file a tax return if you are not earning any taxable income in India. However, now if you, even if you are not earning any taxable income in India, if you have any foreign asset, then you will be liable to file your tax return. Second. Once you are liable to file your tax returns, you have to disclose certain particulars in the return form. Now return form, I just went through today morning and they have classified the disclosures into five categories. First is foreign bank accounts. Foreign bank account is if I am holding a bank account in my name outside India, I am required to disclose the particulars. They have asked me to disclose the name of the bank, address of the bank, country in which I am holding the bank account and the peak balance during the year. Now problem is they are requiring me to disclose the amount in INR. If it's a foreign bank account, my amount will be in the foreign currency. They have not gone and prescribed the rate at which I am to convert. I would assume that it would be safe to say 31st March rate, take it and apply it to the maximum balance on the day and report it. Then. <coughs> Another, uh, huh, one more thing which is required, I had said that they had uh, required that you have to mention the country in which you are holding the account. Now, actually they are asking you to say, give the country code. Country code so far has not been notified anywhere, but if you look at the Excel utility which is available on the income tax website, in the drop down list you will get the country codes. And country codes are nothing but the uh, STD, ISD codes. So if I am reporting US as a country, my country code would be 1. If I am reporting UK, it will be 44 and so on. So for those of you who are not aware, there is no notification out right now. And if you are filing a physical return, I think anyways you are not allowed to file a physical return. But uh, something you might want to know. Second is, uh, after foreign bank account, you are required to disclose the financial interest in an entity. Now again, they have not clarified what do they mean by financial interest. Would financial interest mean if I am holding share of a foreign entity, I am required to disclose? Or whether I have given loan to a foreign entity, would that constitute financial interest? Or whether if I am employed with a foreign company and that foreign company owes me money on the balance sheet date, would that be a financial interest in that company? How do I go about? Now, in my understanding, financial interest would mean interest in the ownership interest in a particular entity. So if I am holding either the shares of a company, equity shares or preference shares, or if it's a foreign firm, I am a partner in the firm. In those cases, I will be required to disclose my investment. Investment for the uh, equity shares would be the cost of equity shares, for preference shares would be the cost of a preference shares to me, and for partnership firm, in my opinion, would be the capital contribution which I have made in the firm. Third is immovable property located abroad. Very simple, they want the address and uh, cost of investment of the property and the country in which I'm holding the property. Any other asset, anything other than one, two, three, if you are holding, report it. And last is accounts where signing authority is held by me and you have not included the, included the above in one, two, four. So what I can think of is 
two kinds of accounts may be possible. One is a bank account where I'm having a signing authority account, maybe in someone else, else's name and I'm a signatory there. In that case, I'm required to report. Second is a DMAT account. But my confusion here lies with how do I report the balance in that DMAT account? They want me to disclose the peak balance in that account. So I'm holding shares in the DMAT account. How do I go and convert those shares on every single day at the market price? First into the respective currency of that country and then into INR and then find out the peak balance. And then it's a very tedious process for me to do. So if you are reporting the DMAT accounts, you might want to be careful. Generally, also, I would like to say that if you are disclosing anything under 125, please have sufficient documentation, backups, everything in place before reporting. Because along with this amendment, they have gone and also amended section 143, saying that if I am holding a foreign asset outside India, income tax department can go and open assessment up to last 16 years. So I am, if I have gone and reported something and I am not having sufficient documentation, I'll be at a loss during the scrutiny proceedings. And uh, other issues would be, okay, if I am a joint holder, I'm, there's a property abroad which I am also holding and my husband is also holding jointly. How do I report it? Do I report it in my accounts or does he report it in his account? Or if both of us report, would it amount to double reporting? There is no clarity. I think it would be safer to report and if at all the scrutiny comes up, you can explain you have your documents in place to show that it's a joint holding. Conversion rate, country codes, okay. Another issue would be now trustees of offshore trust would be individuals resident in India. What happens is if I'm a trustee of an offshore trust, obviously I would have a signing authority in India. So I'll be covered by the provisions of section 139. I'll be required to e-file my tax return. Uh, senior officers of companies. If I am the CFO of an MNC, I'm obviously going to be having some signing authority in some offshore bank account. Again, I'll be covered by the provisions of this account. Another case which uh, would be there is, uh, say if I'm working with an MNC, I have been given shares of my holding company which are listed abroad in, under an ESOP plan. I'll be again required to go and comply with the provisions of this section. Uh, lastly, once applying all the provisions and the amendments and everything, once I have computed my taxable income, comes the point of applying the tax rates. Tax rates for individuals and HUF have been very modified, I'm slightly modified. Earlier they were 0 to 1 lakh uh, 60,000, by 20,000 they have increased. So now, for the first lab is 0 to 1 lakh 80,000, 10%, uh, no tax. 1 lakh 80 to 5 lakhs, 10%, 5 to 8, 20%, and 8 onwards, 30%. Likewise, for women SSEs, they have increased the rate by 20, um, the basic exemption limit has been increased by 20,000. For senior citizens resident in India, the basic exemption limit has been made 2 lakhs 50,000. And now they have introduced a new category called very senior citizens who are more than 80 years old. For them, the basic exemption limit is 5 lakhs. Anything more than 5 lakhs will directly fall in the slab of 20% and uh, more than 8 lakhs, 30%. Another thing which may be noted is for resident women, uh, sorry, for senior citizens, the age limit has been lowered. Earlier, anyone above the age of 65 was considered a senior citizen. Now, if he is above the age of 60 years, he is a senior citizen. The cooperative society tax rates have been left untouched. Then, partnership firm, the tax rate is 30% LLP, 30%. Other rates are also left untouched. Foreign companies, 40%. Anyone other than that is 30%. Trust, AOP, BOI, a slightly tricky case. I have put a separate slide for that, uh, laying down the tax rates. The CES and surcharge, education CES and surcharge, are applicable on my tax liability. Surcharge for domestic companies with income more than 1 crores would be 5% of tax liability. For foreign companies with income more than 1 crores, 2% of tax liability. Other than these two categories of assessees, there is no surcharge anywhere. Education CES is 2% of tax plus surcharge, and she says is, again, 1% uh, of tax plus surcharge. In all, 3% of tax plus surcharges are yeah, uh, CIS. 
okay apart from the uh, standard tax rates i have just uh, taken up some specific frequently used uh, tax rates for short term capital gains on which i am paying sgt tax rate is 15% long term capital gains on which i am paying sgt it is exempt and long term capital gains on which i am not paying sgt the tax rate is 20% profits and gains of life insurance business are taxable at 12 and a half percent uh, income from lottery races gambling games betting 30 percent uh, any anonymous donation received by a firm is 32 is 30 percent on the anonymous donation uh, dividend received by indian company from the specified foreign company this is the new provision which has been brought in 15 percent which we have dealt with earlier basically if i am an indian company and i am receiving dividend from my foreign holding uh, foreign subsidiary i have to pay tax at 15% on it mat is 18.5% llp uh, amt is 18.5% and uh, ddt is 15% tax rates for aop boi very briefly if the tax rates uh, if the shares of members of the aop or boi are determinate that is i know that three members and each has a 50% or uh, 33% share i know the shares beforehand in that case the tax rates are if none of the members has income in excess of the taxable limit that is the members are only individuals and huf and none of the members have any income which is exceeding the basic exemption limit in that case the tax rate applicable would be same as the tax rates applicable to an individual however if there is a non individual or non huf who is a member of the aop or boi the tax rate would be maximum marginal rate further if a company is a member of the aop boi then on the share of the company the tax rate would be the tax rate applicable to a company and on the balance it would be maximum marginal rate and where the share of members is indeterminate again it is higher of maximum marginal rate or if i know who the members are then the maximum rate applicable so if a foreign company is a member then the rate would be 40% and likewise the mmr for assessment year 2013 is 30.9% including such allowances uh, for trust uh, public religious trust public charitable trust and income of these trusts is exempt under section 11 uh, corpus donations to any trust are exempt under section 11 if it is a private religious trust or it is a religion specific charitable trust then it is taxable as an aop and the rates applicable would be rates applicable for an individual assessee uh, if it is a religious charitable trust but it in it some part of his of some part of its income has lost exemption under section 131c or 131d due to non compliance uh, for those only for that particular income the tax rate applicable would be the maximum marginal rate any other taxable income of religious charitable trust would be taxable as aop at the rates applicable to an individual anonymous donations taxable at 30% if the anonymous donation is in excess of 5% of the total donation or rupees 1 lakh a private trust where share of beneficiaries is known the trustee is the representative assessee of each beneficiary and trustee would be taxable to the same capacity as the assessee who it is representing uh, again a private trust where the share of beneficiary is unknown uh, it will be taxable at mmr uh, private trust earning business profits you have to ta- pay tax at M- uh, mmr and again oral trust at mmr last is tax forms the tax forms have been notified only five tax forms have been notified so far for assessment year 1213 uh, itr1 is sahaj it is applicable if you are an individual you are eligible to file sahaj your income has to be either salary income or income from one house property only without any brought forward loss or income from other sources excluding lottery and horse race winnings if i am an individual or an hur and i have income which is say i have two house properties or i have income from other sources from lottery winnings then i'll be required to file itr2 if i have capital gains again i fall under itr2 
uh, individual HUF earning business income, but not a proprietary business income. So basically a partnership business income. So a partner in a firm is required to file ITR 3. A proprietor is required to file ITR 4. Uh, if I'm uh, uh, eligible for presumptive taxation under section 44AD or 44A, I am required to file ITR 4S Sugam, which has been specifically known, a new kind of easier form to fill. Uh, any of these returns can be filed electronically or physical form. If I am filing electronically, I have two options. Either I have to file it with a digital signature or without a digital signature. If I am filing it with the digital signature, I will get an income tax return V form, ITR V or ITR verification form, which will say that filed under a digital signature, I have to take a print and keep it in my file as an acknowledgement. However, if I am not filing it under digital signature, I have to print that ITR V sign it and send it to CPC Bangalore within 180 days of uploading the return online. One copy I can keep for me. While you are filing it, do not fold the ITRV. Don't, uh, don't write anything on the barcode. Let the numbers and the barcode on the ITRV be very clear. Okay. If I am a proprietor and if I am liable to audit under section 44AD, I have to compulsorily file it in electronic form and with a DSC, a digital signature. ITR 5, 6 and 7 have not been notified so far. So if you are filing in these categories, you will not be able to file your tax returns, at least as of today. Uh, who is eligible for ITR 5? A firm, AOP, BOI, Artificial Juristical Person, Cooperative Society, Local Authority has to file ITR 5 compulsorily in an electronic format and with a digital signature certificate. ITR 6 is to be filed by a company electronically and under a digital signature. ITR 7 has to be filed by a trust, certain specified category I have mentioned in the PPT. Yes. Just like if your income is about and like and, 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 and. Uh, If I am a, basically in one of these categories I have to compulsorily physically file and I have to file certain documents also with my tax return. If ITR 1 to 6, they are all paperless returns, I do not need to file any documents. I have to only send this ITR V to CPC Bangalore. ITR 7, in the ITR form itself, they have notified the documents which they want to be uh, attached with the, uh, with the ITR return. E-filing is mandatory for the following classes. One is individuals and HUFs with total income more than rupees 10 lakhs. Resident individuals, HUFs, having assets outside India, that is having foreign assets and requiring that disclosure compulsorily need to e-file their tax returns. Persons required to file ITR 5 or ITR 6, that is companies, firms, AOP, BOI, they also need to e-file and under a digital signature. Last, I think I missed mentioning, if I am liable to audit under section 44AD, even if I am not a firm, I am an individual or an HUF, but I am liable to tax audit, then I have to e-file with her digital signature. Uh, lastly, if I have to if my total income does not include uh, exceed rupees 5 lakhs, total income is only salary and up to 10,000 rupees bank interest and taxes due on my salary have been paid, paid by my employer as TDS, then I am not required to file the tax returns. Lastly, Views are my personal views, do not reflect the views of DSP of Merrill Lynch. Um, any questions? Sorry? I didn't get your word. Trust return. No, no, photocopy. Okay, not original. Photocopy of balance sheet will do. Your TDS certificates need to be original. Okay. Yeah, I'll take the questions later then. We'll uh, take the questions all together at the end of work. If somebody wants to exchange seats with uh, those who will be sitting half the time and would like to share, would somebody like to do that? I I'm willing to do that. Somebody wants Namaste, everyone. Chinal has uh, already explained to you all the relevant provisions of the Finance Act which are having an important bearing while filing the returns for the assessment year 12-13. My role would be to take you through the practical aspects of all these returns. So uh, when this particular topic was allotted to me, 
the first question that came to my mind is that when I am supposed to deal with the practical aspects, it is going to be a very huge task because the practical aspects means I have to take you through all the seven returns, all the forms of seven returns plus I have to take you through the modalities and the facilities through which this particular return should reach the department either in the physical form or through electronic transmission. So what I did, what I preferred is that I have gone through the various presentations made by various speakers on the same subject. Those presentations are very well uh, are wide enough to cover some of the aspects and only those aspects which are not dealt with comprehensively in that, in that presentation. Uh, I have tried to include in my presentation so as to make it my presentation comprehensive so far as the subject is concerned. Um, I will just, uh, I have just referred to some of the presentations. Uh, these presentations are available uh, on the BCS website under the resource tab. So the first presentations uh, made by uh, Mr. Amit Patelji, uh, it is a very comprehensive presentation so far as the electronic facilities and the modalities of the operations are concerned. The facility to my knowledge was first uh, uh, started by the income tax department for the assessment year 6-7. There were errors earlier, we all have uh, cope up with those errors. Now somehow they are trying to streamline this particular process. My experience is that for the past one or two years we are not facing much problem so far as the filing of electronic returns is concerned. Uh, but if in case you, if you want to know, if anybody wants to know what is the process, right since the basics as to how to register yourself on the income tax, income tax side, what is the e-filing procedures, all these aspects are taken care of by this particular presentation. It is a recent presentation of 14 September 2011. From that, there are not much variations so far as the process of electronic filing is concerned. Uh, there are also a couple of other presentations and uh, the instructions are obviously available on the very famous income tax e-filing sites. So that also I have mentioned over here. Uh, before starting with the statutory framework, let me tell you the topic is little bit complex. So I have tried to make the slides simpler, not much of a color. Whenever you see the color, try to be more attentive because then that would be prone to more complexities. So I think I have got next 45 minutes to uh, complete this particular session. There are around 60, 67 slides. Uh, I'll try to complete it and I think I would be able to complete it. Starting with the statutory framework, uh, section 139 of the act deals with filing of the returns of income for various persons. It is rule 12 of the income tax acts which prescribes the form in which the return of income is to be filed and the return of uh, and the manner in which that particular return is to be filed. Uh, Appendix 2 to this income tax rules prescribes the various forms of returns. So whenever a particular form is required to be amended, there is an amendment in the rules and the appendix there too. And accordingly, that, according to that, that particular forms have been amended. Right now, there is an amendment only so far as the four or five forms are concerned. I'll come to it later. I think Jinder has already mentioned about it to you. Uh, the, this particular section of section 143.1a, we are all are aware about it. It allows or rather mandates the assessing officer to make the adjustments from your return of income as to the arithmetical error in the uh, returns and also any incorrect claim if such incorrect claim is apparent from any information in the return. Now what amounts to incorrect claim apparent from any information in the return is also defined. However, let me take you through the verbatim of a particular paper. That paper is uploaded in the income tax file, income tax site and I think uh, it is named as common mistake leading to the raising of a demand. That is an exact verbatim I think in the first paragraph the department has interpreted this particular sentence of in inaccurate information as this. As a general principle, during processing, in case of any inconsistency between the values as entered in the schedules and the cross-referenced values in other schedules or totals or summary in part BTI, part BTI is basically a summary of the total income, part BTTI is again a, gives you the total tax, a tax on total income. So, if case of certain inconsistency, the general rule is that according to department, for incomes, the higher values may be taken. And for expense, losses or deduction, the lower value may be taken. So that is the reason whenever there is a cross-referencing and whenever there is any information which you are disclosing in the return, you see to it that there are not, more, not much inconsistent, the inconsistencies therein because if there are, it would adversely affect you as per this particular uh, interpretation. Coming back to the statutory framework, uh, this forms have been notified by notification number 12 by 2012 dated 20th March 2012 
notified forms for the assessment year 11, uh, 12, 13 are forms Sahas, ITR 2, ITR 3, Sugam, that is ITR 4 as ITR 4 and ITR V. No amendment so far has been prescribed in ITR 5, 6 and 7. Uh, I'll come to the forms of written directly. There are changes in the forms. Uh, no such changes in the forms have been there in Sahaj and Sugam. These forms have been, I think, uh, introduced for the first time last year only. Forms are very simple. I'm sure all of us, there should not be any problem. Only thing is that the department has come up with something called as a printing specification and that particular form should be in color. Please take care of that particular aspect. Also, these particular forms on every page at the top, there is a, a requirement of coating your pad. So, don't miss that particular aspect, do coat the pads because these are the paper forms you don't know in department where your paper go where. Uh, come back to the other changes, uh, so far as ITR 2, ITR 3 and ITR 4 are concerned, uh, not much significant changes. Uh, this long term capital gain in the summary of total income, that is part BTI, they have now bifurcated it into with indexation and without indexation. That is the first chain that they have introduced here. The second one is Schedule HP, that is House Property Relating Income. They are reminding certain additional disclosures from you. These disclosures are, uh, these details as to co-ownership of the properties, percentage of share of the, in ownership and names of the co-owners. These are the mandatory fields, you have to disclose, disclose it in your return of income. So far as the pan of the co-owners and their percentage of share is in the property is there, the fields are provided but those fields are optional. So, I'll just tell you that this details of co-ownership, so far as the share your ultimate computation would not be effective. So you have to and compulsorily mandatory have to fill all these details in your form. Then coming back to changes, uh, Schedule ATG donations, uh, they have just elaborated that particular aspect. One schedule has been incorporated asking certain details where I think the PAN is one of the details. These details are mandatory if you are filling the uh, those particular forms. So you have to cope up with this. So whenever you are asking any documentation from your client, uh, regarding this ATG donation, please see to that you have those relevant details with you. Otherwise, last minute you will come to know that you don't have those details, and there will be problems in uh, you will face problems in uploading the returns and validating it. Then, this is a new schedule, Schedule TR, details of tax relief claimed under Section 90, 90 91. Uh, Jinal has already uh, mentioned it to, about you. This country code, this country code is already there in the ITR schema utility. Uh, I think most of the softwares are also taking care of it. Just there is a drop down list. You have to just 
identify a country that particular code will automatically appear. The tax identification number is nothing but just like we have a pan here in the other country there would be a tax identification number that is something you have to put over here. Nothing very uh, significant so far as this particular schedule is concerned. This is a very important crucial aspect of the disclosure. Please consider this only as a disclosure because I don't know how the department would use this particular disclosure in the coming years. I think uh, in the earlier, I think so far other countries are concerned, these disclosure requirements were already there. This is for the first time that Indian legislation have come up with such kind of disclosure requirements. Um, these disclosures are mandatory in nature, meaning thereby if you fall under the category and if you are having such kind of a details, then you have to mandatory give them. I don't know if there are any penalty requirements specified for not disclosing the same. Otherwise, I think that they would definitely come. Uh, Jinal has already taken you uh, in depth with the various facets of all these uh, additional disclosure requirements, so I will not much, uh, spend much time on it. Only thing is that I will just tell you how this particular information could be used. This foreign bank accounts outside India, there is a column that uh, the peak balance during the year you are supposed to mention in INR. Uh, just to tell you that this peak balance becomes important because if there is a higher variation between the two returns so far as this peak balance is concerned, you may face with an inquiry as to what are the significant amounts which are appearing that in that particular account. So this is I guess the control point so far as this particular information is concerned. Then there is schedule UD that is uh, details of earnings of depreciation. It was a necessity because in the schedule there is a specific schedule for so far as the carry forward losses and uh, borrowed forward losses is concerned. But so far as earnings uh, of depreciation is concerned there were no such schedule prescribed earlier. This fact has been taken care of by the new uh, I, ITR for my ITR returns. Uh, just for the reference, I have mentioned it ITR 4 over there. Mistakes. Uh, friends, uh, we all make mistakes and it is said that man learns from his mistakes. Um, let me tell you when this particular things happen, we all make mistakes. The only thing is that we have to communicate our mistakes to our colleagues so that they will not repeat those mistakes from their end. Take care that you don't communicate your mistakes to your client, otherwise client will follow up, take, keep heavily on you. Uh, the income tax department also makes the mistakes. Uh, these mistakes, uh, I just, when I went through the forms which were notified, uh, I just came across few mistakes. These mistakes were favorable to the SSE. So the income tax department immediately took steps to rectify those mistakes. Um, I think in the new ITR schema, although in the new, the printed forms, those mistakes have, I don't know whether they are taken care of or not. But in the new ITRs, these mistakes are taken care of. I'll just quickly point out some of the mistakes so that whenever you are filing a particular return, just take care whether these particular mistakes are still appearing in the form which you are filing. The first one is that uh, in the ITR2, so far as the schedule of capital gains is concerned, the two items are not considered for the purpose of computation in the final BTI, that is the summary sheet. These are assets in the case of a non-resident who is the first provisor to section 48 is applicable. That is item number B1 of CG and the second is amounts deemed to be long term capital gains under section 54. That is item B4 of schedule CG. I have just given the extract of uh, schedule CG. In that if you see the entire capital gain schedule is divided into two parts. Part A, part B. Part A deals with short term capital gains. Part B deals with the long term capital gains. So far as short term capital gain is concerned, the total of short term capital gain is uh, somewhere over here, that point number 4. Uh, this total is divided into two parts, that is under gains applicable under 111A and other than 111A. This bifurcation was required because of the special rate of tax involved in case of 111A. So far as long term capital gain is concerned, you can see there are two red marks, I will come to it later. Item number 2 and item number 3 are also taken care of so far as the final computation is concerned. I will just take you to the next slide. I may have to come back to the earlier slide. If you can see the uh, yellow parts portion and uh, that orange portion, this is nothing but a yellow and orange portion of the first schedule which is taken care of mapped properly in the summary sheet. If you see the green, two green portions, those are also taken care of in the summary sheet. But if you see the red portions, these portions are not clubbed and taken in the main computation that is part BTI. So just check whether in your particular software or whatever forms you are filing this particular part is taken care of or not. Otherwise it would be beneficial to you. There is another mistake uh, uh, I have thought means it might probably lead to the confusion. 
uh, in the computation of income part vti income from other sources these are the mistakes in from iti2 uh, the income is divided to two part number one is income from sources other than from horses horses and winning from lottery and secondly income from uh, income from owning race horses now friends you might wonder if the first part excludes income from winning of lottery then where it is included actually the thing is that uh, this is an error that particular point number 4a already includes income from winning from lotteries so there is no need to make any confusion this is a spelling mistake or what you can say is just a drafting error from income side side that particular error has also been taken care of uh, some of the mistakes i have not uh, uh, referred over here but there was also a mistake in um, from itr4 so far as the schedule bp that is uh, business and profession income from business profession is concerned there the schedule is divided into three aspects number one is income from normal business second is number that is b is income from specified business and income from speculative business so far as the final computation that is part vti is concerned yeah. income from specified business was earlier not mapped properly it was taken out so that probably you would be end up paying lesser taxes department realized the mistakes and it immediately uh, rectified the same not that it has rectified all the mistakes there are certain mistakes which are not favorable to the ssc in the same case these particular mistakes results in additional tax burden on you because at some point of time at some place there is a double disallowance that might be computed that mistake has not been rectified yet uh, i'll take you to that particular mistake through the uh, as and when the process, uh, procession progresses friends um, this idr forms let me tell you are very wonderfully drafted in the sense there is a great thought process which has gone into this particular forms so so if you want to uh, rather uh, i would rather suggest that all the articles or uh, youngsters who are over here please see to it that if you have not cleared your c and if you are still studying or irrespective of that please see to that you will file at least two to three idr forms properly in this coming uh, season the reason being that even if you study the itr four forms properly uh, some of the or other many of the schemes uh, or provisions of the income tax act would be very clear to you and it's like when you go through this particular returns those provisions will come to you automatically you have already seen the size of the book which jinal was carrying i think if you just spend some time on this particular uh, return it would be better so far as your exams are also concerned as a base i cannot just explain all the uh, income tax forms due to paucity of time so i have taken this itr4 as a base i was earlier wondering if i can take itr6 also but since it is not in notified yet i thought it prudent that itr4 which is applicable to the proprietors i think i would take this particular form first uh, jina correct me if i am wrong uh, this particular itr4 form can be filed either electronically or there is also a possibility for filing it physically as i could see from uh, jina's side so Whereas those people who are not filing it electronically have to be more cautious because this form is very much complicated. Wherever there is a color, please try to be more attentive. Um, the for form is divided into two parts. Part A deals with the general information, and Part B deals with the computation of income tax and tax liability. The general information is again divided into various clauses: the personal information, filing status. audit information nature of business i think all of us are aware about it i, I will not spend much time about on it but no doubt yes the personal information it is very necessary to report correct residential status because please note if a particular person is a non resident and if you are still filing his return as a residential it will go to a different circle and it would amount to an offense so please remember that uh, obviously it would also have an impact on your uh, tax liability Uh, then so far as the fifth point is concerned the balance sheet and profit and loss account itr4 i am referring to the balance sheet and profit and loss account for the year under consideration this is nothing but just what you have been prepared for your client or other what your client has prepared and signed on it this is just an information which you are supposed to take and feed in this particular form uh, in fact that is the precise reason in fact if you see the other information the second last point Uh, it also generally takes care of uh, all the information which is available in your form 3cd which is having an important bearing on your computation of income 
In fact, that is the reason why they have done away with the requirement of uh, attaching all the forms or all the paper, whatever balance sheets, P&L to these particular forms because all those data, financial data which was required, necessarily required for the purpose of their analysis of your income tax return is already taken care of by the new forms. Um, so far as this balance sheet and PLN for the year under consideration is concerned, I would just mention right now that point number 42 and 43 of part A PNL, which is in the general information, are very much important. These points, point number 42, deals with the depreciation as, your, as per your books of accounts. As we all know that while making a computation, I have to make the adjustment for the depreciation. Point number 43 is the book profit. This would be going to be the starting point of my schedule BP. And all the adjustments, whatever it is I would be making, would be made through this particular figure. So please note, whenever these particular figures are there, those figures have been appropriately picked up by schedule in, in schedule BP. Otherwise, you will face problem. I'll anyway, come to it later. I'm going to explain all these things to you. Uh, then quantitative details, again, this will give you the details regarding stocks. Uh, part B, computation of income and tax liability, it deals uh, basically deals with four parts, that is computation of total income, we all are aware, aware about the concept of total income, then the computation of tax liability, uh, that is the computational mechanism, then the discharge of tax liability, that is how you have discharged it and table or refund or maybe nil returns as the case may be. Starting with the first part of uh, that PNL balance sheet, I was mentioning two items, that is item number 42 and 43. This is the snapshot of it. Item number 42 deals with depreciation, item number 43 deals with profit before taxes. Here, friends, I would like to make you a, uh, take you, may make a very good point that whenever you are making a computation for your client, don't just rely upon any software. I am not saying that the software will give you the wrong results, but it is always better for your understanding and also for your uh, for, for, the, for your safety that you first make a manual computation software obviously the results of the software you can cross check with your manual computation if at all you are making the manual computation and ha having a habit of making the computation manually then try to make your computation with this particular figure as a starting point because uh, this figure is nothing but profit before taxes we also have a habit of making a computation profit after taxes add back taxes Generally avoid that in order to, because it will make the figures comparable then. I will now come to the other information part. As I said, this other information part is linked up with form 3CD uh, of your uh, financial statements, whatever reports uh, you are signing and your client is also signing. So uh, I have just tried to map these two aspects, the information which is apparent, which is required to be disclosed in other information and that information where you can get from a particular clause in from 3CD. Uh, I think last, next 7 to 8 slides are just giving you the mapping information. This information you are gonna, it would be very useful to you. Uh, I think the photocopies of that this particular presentation have not been circulated but I have been told that this particular presentation would be put up on the BCS website. So from there you can take this particular aspect, it would be a ready material for you. During the pressure time, you can just ask your junior to just Baba, isme hai, wo dekhe, isme dalo. it would save time, it's just a punching item, nothing else. And if you want to cross verify what he has done, you can just randomly go through some of the items to see whether he has, whatever he has reported is correct or not. It helps in the last time barring pressures. So I will not go through each and every item in greater depth, but I think uh, there are certain items which I have mentioned here. Uh, I'll just explain you, so far as the left hand side, I've gone item wise, other information, whatever items are there I've take, taken and whatever uh, relevant corresponding items from Form 3 CD I've taken. You can see some red items, color, there is a confusion, I'll come to it later while explaining the mapping exercise. But I think these all amounts, item number 7, you can see another item over here. Amounts of expenditure in relation to income which does not form part of the total income, the red item. It means basically 14A issue. Uh, this is what I am I'm a little bit concerned about. It, it might res result in a double deduction or double addition and might res uh, affect your computation of income. So this aspect, please be attentive when I will be explaining. I am sure you all are attentive right now. Um, these all are just a mapping exercise. Uh, nothing much about it. Some of the information which is available in Form 3CD is not there in either information, but it is there in Form Schedule BP, like this interest disallowable intersection 23 of MSME Act, 
this information again is we are required to report it in form 3 CD but at the same time its information is also required to be reported in your form of, form of return in schedule BP serial number 19 with this friends uh, just this mapping exercise after explaining to you I'll just take you to the computation of the income as I said uh, this this particular entire returns have been designed very carefully so this will give you the entire scheme for students it would be a very good learning exercise as you can see item number one two three this what I am explaining to you is part BTI that is a summary sheet of the computation of income which is there a part of your return of income uh, IDR4 as you can see uh, the heads of income we all are aware of salaries income from house property profits and gains capital gains income from other services total income Friends, uh, there are various schedules to, the, to which this summary sheet is linked and according to me all the final result of the schedules are automatically picked up in this main summary sheets but please, please be sure that all this mapping and all this hyperlinking is properly affected into your software uh, otherwise there would be again that department to come up with the uh, adjustment which they are otherwise mandatory entitled to make uh, salaries, income from house properties, profits all the club clubbing of the everything will give you the total income uh, as uh, you are already aware that while computing this particular income under a particular head I have to consider the source all the income coming from the various sources under that particular head so if there is one head there are two sources of under that particular head one source gives me the profit other source gives me the loss then I have to report the net figure under that particular income something which we generally called as an intra head setting intra -head set off of losses so this figure number 6 that is total income which you will receive it would be after making the intra head setting of losses against the income uh, you will get this figure uh, probably not directly because that summation formula is not there anywhere in the in that particular income tax return schedule but if you see schedule CYLA in that is uh, carry current year loss adjusted there is a total I will come to it a little bit later but that particular total can match with this particular total of income after you make the intra head adjustments you what you are supposed to do is the inter head adjustment that is uh, making the adjustments of income under one head against the loss under other head so basically there are rules to that effect this point number 7 deals with this inter head adjustments schedule CYLA then after you make those adjustments again there is law also kind enough to provide you that brought forward losses from the earlier years you can set it off against the same so this point number 9 will tell you keep how much loss you would be of the previous year you are entitled to set off against the income which is remaining unadjusted after setting of the current year losses this 6 minus 7 minus 9 would give you the gross total income this gross total income again there is nothing specific formula or summation given in the schedule but you can get it from the residual amount in uh, uh, schedule BFLA this will form your gross total income so please note your gross total income would be after making the intra head adjustment and inter head adjustments and also the brought forward losses from that gross total income we reduce chapter 6 a deductions to arrive at a total income there are certain income which are exempt from tax like agricultural income but we have to consider it for rate purpose that will be added which will give us the aggregate income and this aggregate income would determine your tax rate per se friends uh, there is a, another item called unadjusted losses of current year to be carried forward to future years which would include unabsorbed depreciation I never I just applied my mind as to why this particular information is given I think it is because of section applicability of section 80 which says that if there is a loss return and if you don't file it in time then so far as the, that particular year's loss is there you won't be able to carry it further this is exactly what it is a department wants to identify how much portion if in case of a uh, delayed return how much portion of the loss you have incurred in that particular current year this is the information which the department would be able to get from this particular column coming back to the competition of income I will now take you just like the scheme is like this the entire income tax return is divided into two parts part A general information part B computation part B there is a specific summary sheet that summary sheet will take you to uh, other schedules some of the schedules contain sub schedules so this is how it is now we are what I am explaining to you is schedule BP that is computation of income from business and profession this is a schedule the end result of this particular schedule will be taken care of in your summary sheet Hence, this schedule is very important to understand. It is divided into three parts. Number one, 
पार्ट ए डील्स विद फॉर्म्स ऑफ बिजनेस एंड प्रोफेशन अदर देन स्पेक्यूलेटिव एंड स्पेसिफाइड बिजनेसेस आई वुड फॉर आवर अंडरस्टैंडिंग पर्पज कंसिडर्ड एज अ नॉर्मल बिजनेस दिस नॉर्मल बिजनेस ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स इन द शेड्यूल द प्रॉफिट्स एंड गेन्स फ्रॉम द प्रेजेंटिव काइंड ऑफ कैटेगरी ऑफ द बिजनेसेस लाइक फोर्टी फोर एडी फोर्टी फोर एडी and also the deductions under section 10 10a or this part is also covered in this particular so whenever a particular part is got the subtotal of a b and c are going to be linked up this particular linking would be there in your final schedule as i mentioned earlier there was a mistake in itr 4 form that when this particular form was designed this particular third item which is given in red that is profits and gains of a specified business was not earlier clubbed or mapped in this particular summary sheet the department has taken care that now this particular item would be clubbed at least in this in its uh, idr schema excel utility uh, i have just tried to analyze uh, the schedule bp uh, if you can see the first part the, the starting point point number 1 in this uh, is profits before taxes this is a starting point from that particular schedule which i referred earlier that this is the figure of the uh, general information which would be automatically linked up and it would be the starting point this is item number 43 of that particular part a pnl schedule this would be the starting point from that what first they have done in all this particular uh, sheet whatever slide you are looking at uh, what they have done is that all the extraordinary uh, incomes they have reduced straight away so you can see the net profit and losses from speculative business they have taken away Space net profit from the specified business under 35 AD they have taken away. Then income receipts credited to other under other heads they have taken away. Means which are credited to profit and loss but are uh, club they are to be categorized or taxed under other head they have taken away. Then this present 44 AD profits they have taken away and income credited or profit and loss account which are exempt that also they have taken away. Except item number five or other items are forming part of your return of income at some other places. so far as uh, this i have just this uh, 2i and 2ii the red color, yellow color and the orange color is concerned speculative business and specified business these are covered in the part b and c this is just an extract of that particular uh, part b and part c if you see whatever yellow portion is there the total of that particular would be automatically linked up to b38 which you can see over here and from there you have to make the adjustment similarly so so far as the specified business is concerned that particular figure would be linked up with uh, c42 and you have to make the adjustment the combined result of everything would be d which would be the ultimately linked up to your final schedule so this is little bit complicated that's why the color um after reducing from your main profits and loss or the starting point the income part now the department has prescribe that you also add back the expenses part which are otherwise allowable under other rates of income this point number 7 you can see expenses debited to the profit and loss account considered under other rates of income point number 8 please note expenses debited to profit and loss account which relate to exempt income that is section 14a disallowances have been added back so when there is a point number 9 that is total 7 plus 8 it is already after disallowing your 14 uh, items i am going to tell you that this particular item is again added back when you come to the next particular slide so while making an entry if you see there is a green figure i think that particular figure is not allowed, uh, uh, visible over here but this expense debited is an figure which you are supposed to enter manually it nowhere links up nothing it is not picked up from anywhere so as far as possible so far as 14a disallowance is concerned i would recommend that don't enter any figure over here because if you enter figure over here then it would result in a disallowances i think the same mistake was was there i am not very sure in the last year's return also so far as the uh, other part is concerned depreciation we all makes the depreciation adjustment point number 11 depreciation debited to profit and loss account included in 9 uh i think this is again an automatic item so it will be linked up it will give you the profit and adjustment and depreciation if you can see all these other figures uh in blue color these are automatic linked up with this i'll just tell you some of the figures from oi schedule other information are taken care of by here some of the schedules are not automatically mapped you have to enter it in manually i've just prepared a sheet as to which figures are automatically linked up and which figures are uh, you have to manually allowed this 
सीरियल नंबर सिक्स सेवन एट एट बी नाइन एंड टेन आर ऑटोमेटिकली लिंक अप इन दैट शेड्यूल सीरियल नंबर सेवन इफ यू सी ऑफ द अदर इन्फॉर्मेशन इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स फोर्टीन एट इलेवन सो इफ यू एंटर इट ओवर देयर इट विल बी इंक्लूडेड ओवर हियर एंड इफ यू एंटर इट अबो देन इट विल बी अ डबल कॉम्पिटिशन सो डोंट एंटर जस्ट टेक केयर वाइल एंटरिंग दिस पर्टिकुलर फिगर मैन्यूल एंट्रीज ये सीरियल नंबर थर्टीन फोर्टीन एंड फाइव दीज आर द मैन्यूल एंट्रीज these uh, you have to make manually if you don't make it would have an impact in your profit and loss it will affect your competition of income uh, there are certain items for which no although appearing in oi which are having an impact on your financial statements are not specifically provided for in your schedule bp you can adjust it among the residuary held which are specified over here um, again this is nothing but like as i said there are certain schedules which contains the sub schedules so these schedules are linked up to those sub schedules i have just given you the list of those items probably you can check the cross referencing is correct or not capital gain after completing the business profession business of profession there is something called as a capital gain uh, there is nothing much to speak about it only thing is that in the computation that is schedule of cg uh just take care that you don't and mention any uh, long term capital gain which is exempt those figures are not supposed to be entered over here because those are not forming part of the total income there is a specific separate schedule for that so enter it over there income from other sources uh, again these are divided into three parts income other than owning resources income from owning and maintenance of the resources and income from winning of lotteries uh the reason why there are there is a distinction with they have bifurcated it is because so far as owning and maintenance resources is concerned there are special provisions for carry forward and shut off of losses so far as winning and the winning of lottery is concerned it is chargeable to tax a special rate uh with this i just quickly run through i know i am falling short of time it, i i will take just 5 or 5 to 7 minutes to complete this presentation uh internet adjustments and shut offs uh, we all are aware all are aware that these are the current year losses which are adjusted uh, just i explained earlier these are the brief provisions business loss can be set off only against cannot be set off against salary income speculation loss can be set off only against speculation income specified business under section 35 dbing can be set off against only uh, specified business owning maintaining uh, 713 losses under the capital gain cannot be set off against any other head and losses under the head income from house property can be set off under income under any other head this is just a presentation of that from cyla if you see the red uh, the uh, yellow portion will give you the income income whatever whatever income you have reported whatever the end result of the income schedule that is given over there if there is a loss then don't that particular figure will not be picked up over here over here because ultimately it's a loss house property losses just see it can be adjusted against any other so source of income because there is only house property uh, that particular part is shown black business of losses other than speculation and business losses salary income it is it cannot be set off against salary income so that is black portion business portion obviously it would be like it can be set off against anything else similarly loss other sources losses losses from resources again except for that particular other sources it can be set off against anything else i think that this this is of so far as this cyla uh, schedule is concerned so far as the brought forward losses are concerned again there are seven types of provisions one dealing with the house property which can be set off can brought forward and set off only against house property business other than speculation speculative business specified business short term capital loss long term capital loss and business of owning and maintenance section 80 which i referred to you earlier these are the important provisions if you see the schedule this schedule is nothing but the uh, bifurcation of or rather the uh, pictorial representation of all these provisions you can see the red marking over here that is the due date of filing the return if you have not filed a return within the due date then it is going to be a problem so while filing this filling this particular schedule please see, see to it that you are making this particular entry properly otherwise it would it would not give you the benefit of that unadjusted losses carried forward house property losses can be carried for for 8 years you can see it over here losses from business other than speculative business 8 years speculative specified business uh speculative and uh, other sources from owning 4 years uh, losses of specified business 2 years short term capital loss 8 years long term capital loss 8 years after making the summary of all these things what you will get is an adjustment of above losses in bfla so first it will give you the total and whatever adjustments you are making those adjustment will be refer referred in that particular clause number 10 this item is again linked up to your main cfl schedule i'll show it how there is again a, they have given a bifurcation of schedule ud that is unabsorbed depreciation which is newly introduced 
now coming to bsla i am telling you that income portion which is after making the intra interhead set offs they are coming over here brought forward losses would be picked up from that particular schedule and it will be taken care of over here again if you see the so far as cyla is concerned these are the brought the losses including unabsorbed depreciation whereas in this particular figure this particular uh, schedule they are asking the bifurcation of brought forward losses and brought forward depreciation in fact that is the precise reason why this particular unabsorbed depreciation schedule has been introduced because then th this will give you a by this will enable you make a proper bifurcation and enter the correct figures these figures are to be entered manually and it is are not automatically automatic figure other schedules again quarterly break up break up of capital gain um, i will not spend much time about it because uh, i think mr amit patel has already taken care of this particular aspect in his presentation but uh, you have to give the capital break up of uh, this particular capital gain for the purpose of computation of uh, interest under section 234c please note that this would be applicable only if there is a capital gain if there is a capital gain per se if there is a capital loss you don't have to worry about it further there is a provision uh, in section 234c which says that if your capital gain if you are paying all the capital gain liability before 31st march then you don't have to worry about your interest uh, under section 234c so if you have paid off your liability before 31st march then that you you, you need not worry about this particular schedule special rates this is another schedule uh, i'll take 2 to 3 minutes special rate another schedule uh, this is again some of the items have been uh, uh, chargeable to tax at special rate four items that is uh, gains cap capital gains chargeable to tax under section 111a then long term capital gain with indexation long term capital gain without indexation and winning from lotteries these items are already there you have reported it in your uh, return of income so you have to take that particular cross reference from that particular figure and report it over here i have just mentioned a uh, relative cross references please be sure that there is no mismatch in that particular rate so far as gta is concerned if more than one rate is applicable then this 10 is just a notional figure you have to just enter the income portion and calculate the tax schedule tds and it again nothing much to say about it just to note that this unique tds certificate number are, are not mandatory whenever you are filling these particular details in your tds1 and tds2 please ensure that those are in commensurate with your form 26 as because all of us are aware the department is taking too much time and making there is a problem so far as their processing of the demands are processing of the refunds are concerned um schedule it again all so far as the advanced taxes and self assessment taxes are concerned right proper date of deposit because this will impact your computation uh, interest computation under 234 abc so please see to it that your date of deposit is correct also challan serial number all this information is correct and is matching with form 26 as otherwise there would be issue so far as the credit of that particular amount is concerned before uploading uh, ensure that whatever form whatever liability you have that particular form or electronic utility has worked out it matches with the manual working which you have done uh, and uh, also recheck the control figures like total income that is part b of total uh, ti aggregate tax liability that is part b of tti that is tax on total income total taxes paid and amount payable refundable at least to make these control checks before you upload the return press the upload button i would rather recommend that take a print out also go through the physical copy of the return and only you are satisfied that all the figures are correctly reported then upload the thing otherwise you are always having an option of revised return uh, so far as the other details are concerned i have already mentioned residential status date of birth those effect your computation of tax liability so enter it properly in case of refund i am sure everybody will take care of that so far as the micr code and bank details are concerned uh, enter it correctly and uh, just just one thing wherever there is a requirement of filing of electronic returns by digital signature please be sure that your digital signature is not expired and if it is expired get it renewed first because at the last moment you will realize that there is no digital signature with which i can file the return uh, this digital signature essentially is required to be registered i think that process would be also be taken that part is also explained by uh, aminjis uh, that particular presentation i thank you all thank you Thank you, Mr. General, both for your excellent presentation. With this, may I now request also the winner of the local competition to give badges of vote of thanks to the two speakers.
I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Ms. Gina for demonstrating her detailed insight on the budget amendments affecting the tax returns for the assessment year 12-13. Further, I would like to express our sincere thanks to her for giving an excellent coverage to general pointers when filing the income tax returns. We are very grateful to Mr. Mandar for his lucid way of explanation on the practical aspects of filing the income tax return for the assessment year 12-13. It will be very useful for us and will surely reduce our errors while filing the income tax return this year. Well, friends, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for detail. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. Thank you.